today's World Insight, the heated race for a COVID-19 vaccine as the world learns to deal with the new normal. The medical journal editor and the Chinese pharmaceutical school dean get us up to speed. Well, we really need to have a vaccine. And big changes to our lives after nearly half a year of the coronavirus pandemic. How did artists, in pursuit of their crop, get used to this new normal? This is Beijing 798 Art Zone for answers. Um, very associated with this group of artists in the early 2000s, 2010s called Post Internet. Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei. COVID-19 spreads, some say virtually unchecked, across the United States. John Hopkins' tally showed that the total confirmed cases in the U.S. surged to over 3 million. Health experts fear in five to seven days there will be a new spike in cases. So what's the public health prognosis in the U.S.? Many believe that people have to deal with a new normal, a time when we have to learn to coexist with the virus and it may take quite a while. So is the vaccine the only light at the end of the dark tunnel? What's the latest on the making of vaccines and how will they be delivered? I asked Eric Rubin these questions. He is the editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Take a listen. In your journal, New England Journal of Medicine recently, have been articles about asymptomatic, the percentage of asymptomatic, and their relations to the so-called pre-symptomatic, meaning uh, actually eventually become symptomatic only at the time of the tests, the symptoms were not very obvious. So uh, how should we understand these increasing numbers of concepts and concepts that we do not know thoroughly? Are you satisfied, Dr. Rubin, about the speed of our increasing knowledge of this virus so far? I think that we haven't gotten a good handle on the ratio of asymptomatic to symptomatic disease. And just now studies are being done. Uh, we haven't really published any of them yet, but I know that there are, there's information coming out there about how many people are asymptomatic. It's a relatively simple thing to test for, but it costs some tests and that's not, we, we are still limited in testing in the US in other countries which have fewer limits, it's going to be easier to tell. But in order to tell that number, you have to have a sufficient num amount of disease and a sufficient number of tests to do surveillance, to use them for surveillance rather than just for treating patients. Mm -hmm. um, I think we are making progress in uh, the th figuring out what the therapies of disease should be. And, and, and in particular, Clearly, the, the death rate appears to be dropping. Um, it's dropped considerably from since the uh, initial outbreak in China. It's varied considerably from country to country, but I think that our supportive care has gotten much better. Our specific therapies are are a little behind that, but they're they're people working toward that. Mm. Uh, that I'd also say I'd also add that the pace of vaccine development is incredibly impressive. I don't know that means that it means it will end up with a vaccine shortly, but the, there is a huge amount of effort. Let's talk about the treatment a bit, especially combination of treatment, remdesivir, uh, for example, which is being considered as one of the, uh, the medicines that could help with the process of particularly curing, curing the severely diseased. Uh, have been, uh, you know, collected and bought uh, by the United States, mainly uh, complained, uh, mainly, and the price is really uh, gigantic, uh, if, given the uh, ordinary price of uh, medicines of the same category. So, uh, Dr. Rubin, how shall we see um, the interests within border and the interest globally? Remdesivir is a uh, a special case, and I, I think it should, of course, be broadly available um, across the globe. Um, there are issues with remdesivir. Number one, it doesn't appear to be that good. Um, so it's not a miracle cure for anything. No. It will be useful for people who are the most sick. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like a tool at this point that's going to help us control the outbreak. All it's going to do is 
we hope, save some lives. And we don't e haven't even proven that yet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but that it looks encouraging for saving some lives. Um, but it won't be the public health tool that uh, that we need, or at least not at this point. Um, and then it's 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 just recently approved um, in the U.S. And there isn't very much of it. And so the questions of how it gets allocated are substantial, both in the US and should it be made as it should be available internationally uh, there because there's just not gonna be that many doses available. Mm. Um, so right now it's not the solution. Um, it's a tool mm. and, and one of many, but no question it and any other therapy that made a difference should be more broadly available and should be thought of as a world resource rather than something that a single company owns. Uh, we have invested, we, the US government, um, has invested a large amount of money in, in developing this drug um, and paying for clinical trials. And we should be using that, the leverage we have because of that to uh, mm. make sure that it becomes available. So you are suggesting, Dr. Rubin, that it is about national border as long as this specific country invests in certain things and it should have the priority or um, be no, the president in I, a way I, in, 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 in having, having ownership of it and therefore it's not global public good. Is that what you're trying to say? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I'm saying that the because, in part because of the investment that we've made in that drug and almost any other drug that's developed, mm. they should be seen as a public resource. And not a US only resource, but a public resource. And we mm. should be thinking about how best to use them uh, rather than how best to make money off of them. China suggested uh, through, its, uh, through the country's uh, president that it will become a public, global public good, quote unquote, that's exactly what he said. We haven't seen pledge of that in, from any other country of the world or any other organization of the world. So how should we see the quite challenging reality we're facing right now if there were any successful vaccines? I agree with that sentiment. It's, it's vitally important that any vaccine be made widely available and not doing so is counter to the interests of any individual country. It's not as if countries exist in isolation now. If mm. there's an outbreak in uh, Cambodia, it affects China. If there's an outbreak in Mexico, it affects the US. Mm. Um, we have an interest in making sure that, ev that infectious diseases, which don't respect borders, are controlled everywhere. So I think it's in everyone's interest that vaccines be widely available. And it's also the right thing to do. It's the ethical thing to do. Mm. But to prepare in advance, that's the point, isn't it? That's why CEPI, Gavi uh, are existing. They are supposed to establish platforms, and so are the latest platforms by the, uh, the Gates Foundation in cooperation with the uh, uh, WHO and things like that. So uh, so-called accelerator in a way. Uh, this is about that. I think that's right. And, and I should say that CEPI and Gavi have had the participation of a, most of the major pharmaceutical companies. So it's, mm. they, they do buy into the idea. This is a little more complicated because many of the players in, the, in this vaccine space are small biotechs. They're companies that don't have the experience of producing a global vaccine in the past. Mm. Um, and it, it might depend on who produces it, but I think that they're is an impulse among many of the vaccine developers to make it widely available, even if, even if any particular government is not so supportive of that idea. But we see that with the swine flu, for example, uh, with, mm -hmm. with all kinds of diseases. In fact, many of the diseases that humans have, with my little knowledge about uh, public health, is a lot of them orig originally are coming from the animal world to the human world. Right? You could also argue we are actually part of that world anyway. So if we exclude those uh, opportunities, actually we could only live, uh, some could argue, in, in vacuum. Uh, so that is about how we can coexist with the reality like that, but at the same time taking better care of ourselves. But how would that be done? That is probably the most gigantic question the public health community around the world need to face right now. 
I, I think there are a couple of answers to that. Um, one is that we should be careful about what sorts of interactions we have with animals, mm. uh, particularly wild animals, because a lot of the, the, new, the new severe outbreaks like this one come from animals that we don't ordinarily interact with, probably. Mm. Um, and, and if we're going to interact with them, then, we're not, then we've got to be careful about keeping them um, caged, keeping them around people. Um, we, we really want to think through where do the risks occur. Mm -hmm. with, with influenza, which is our longtime nemesis, we know that that's an animal virus. We know that it's going to come from animals. The best thing we can do for that is anticipate it. And, and anticipating it means surveying the animals, which is being done particularly in China, um, and looking for, the, uh, for new viruses arising and being prepared should those cross into humans. Uh, and that's really important. I think mm. we, we were not adequately prepared for another coronavirus crossing over. We should similarly prepare, be prepared for the next coronavirus outbreak. Science sheds light on our questions and doubts over the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the onset of the viral outbreak, we've been hearing about a therapeutic treatment. The race to test and make drugs in treating COVID-19 patients has been ramped up on a global scale. People are looking at life-saving drugs like remdesivir before a vaccine is available. For its part, Chinese medicine could also offer a viable treatment. But the big question remains, how far away are we from having a potent and affordable COVID-19 vaccine? What's the stumbling blocks to vaccine research? For answers about these, earlier I talked to Ding Sheng, the Dean and the Bayer Distinguished Professor of the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Tsinghua University. Let's listen to his answers from his lab. Uh, certainly, uh, COVID-19 uh, hit us uh, pretty suddenly. Um, certainly, we know uh, from the general public, uh, from our government, uh, and all, all the researchers, uh, we need to find a cure uh, for this disease as soon as possible. Uh, certainly, uh, do, uh, to do this, to accomplish this in a fairly short period of time, it's very challenging. Uh, so that's why, initially, we really focus on drug repurposing strategy to find old drugs uh, that can potentially uh, treat this specific disease. Uh, as we actually uh, move along uh, this research and development, we now know uh, old drugs actually uh, may still have some specific effect or efficacy for a specific population uh, of the patient. Uh, but certainly, they're not very efficacious uh, in treating or containing this disease. This time, the pandemic falls on a time when the world is getting even more complicated than it used to be. Uh, geopolitics could be one of those factors. How to make sure that your research could be free from the influence of geopolitics? I guess maybe that's someone, as the head of this huge research center, you have to think about from time to time. Uh, as scientists, uh, actually, we really focus on uh, research. Uh, we really focus on uh, you know, uh, a, a common uh, goal that's really about uh, developing a cure uh, for this disease. Uh, so I would say um, uh, over the last uh, uh, six months, uh, the, international uh, the international biopharmaceutical community and the biomedical researchers are actually all focusing on this uh, common goal. Uh, people actually across uh, different countries, uh, different institutions actually, are really um, making all the data available, working together actually towards this goal. Uh, here uh, at our center actually, uh, at, very, at the very beginning actually, uh, we created uh, an open portal uh, data sharing uh, system. Uh, basically uh, through this portal actually, uh, we share actually all the data uh, relating to uh, uh, antiviral research and also um, uh, all the uh, literature references and also our internal uh, drug discovery uh, results actually are uh, shared uh, on this portal. Well, Professor Ding, many wonder, the research uh, about the areas which you are focusing on be totally or strongly transformed by the research 
specifically looking at COVID-19? Uh, in terms of um, the, the international support uh, or in terms of uh, the recognition of significance of such uh, potential disease, uh, 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 such type of uh, emergent public health disease, uh, I think uh, COVID-19 uh, really transformed um, our understanding, uh, the government understanding, the general public understanding uh, of, that, uh, of this threat. Uh, in the past, certainly, uh, we, uh, we as scientists uh, know about this. Uh, and people have uh, perhaps uh, predicted about such events. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, the, the resources uh, and efforts actually uh, that were put into this, uh, it's actually uh, not sufficient. Uh, that's why uh, in many ways, uh, perhaps uh, our international uh, pharmaceutical uh, societies uh, are not that prepared uh, for such outbreak. Uh, that's why we don't really have a uh, very efficacious drug actually that can be deployed uh, right away. Professor Ding, we've been hearing every day in the news development here, advancement there. But exactly what is the reality check we should have in mind in terms of our research related to therapeutic treatment? Yeah, certainly uh, over the last few months actually, uh, there has been a tremendous new understanding uh, about actually drug repurposing efforts. Uh, certainly, uh, as we all know, uh, the drug repurposing efforts actually has some miss and hits. Uh, for example, uh, the chloroquine uh, didn't really show much efficacy in large uh, double-blinded clinical trials. Uh, but we also know uh, uh, drug, antiviral drugs like remdesivir actually had some uh, specific effect in certain uh, stage of this disease. Uh, and now actually uh, the company is further developing an inhaled form of this drug uh, for actually uh, targeting uh, the disease uh, early on. Uh, and also we know actually very recently uh, an old anti-inflammatory drug, dexamethasone, actually uh, has specific benefits uh, in actually late stage uh, of this disease. Uh, actually, there's a, a significant uh, mortality rate reduction. Uh, certainly, we will continue actually uh, to gain a new understanding and to better actually uh, uh, develop uh, those actually drug repurposing uh, molecules uh, towards actually specific population of uh, patients and also in specific combinations. Uh, to really deal with this um, uh, virus uh, in the long run, uh, one is really to have a better therapeutics for sure. Uh, that can be used to treat actually uh, infected patients. But also actually uh, uh, we really need to have a vaccine uh, for actually uh, long term uh, um, at a society level actually to really contain. But you know it's only 7% before the trial. In the middle of the trial, 20% successful rate there could be. And now we are seeing things getting to the third trial, third stage mm -hmm. trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would take a long time. Mm -hmm. And we know now that even those who have had COVID-19 after being treated, still the antibody could be gone in a few months. So is a vaccine ever possible? Yeah, certainly uh, there are still a lot of unknowns. Uh, but I think um, overall uh, the, our society or our uh, biomedical research community are still hopeful uh, for, for the vaccine. Uh, what we know is really, uh, as you mentioned actually, uh, there are quite a few different type of uh, vaccines um, actually are now uh, in late stage trials, uh, phase two and phase three trials. Uh, certainly in coming months actually uh, we'll know actually uh, how uh, those different vaccines actually uh, can protect uh, uh, people from infection uh, and also uh, how those vaccines can really uh, modulate uh, or, or, uh, or modify the disease uh, severity. Uh, I think those uh, early, date, uh, early data will come out actually uh, in the next few months. How possible is it that human beings will be able to resume the way we used to have to live our lives, to travel internationally, to interact without a mask mm -hmm. or being two meters away from one another? How fast and how possible? Um, yeah, I think actually uh, 
uh, traveling internationally uh, have uh, a country really uh, open up uh, is still challenging. Uh, but uh, really uh, zeroing this out uh, uh, so far is a good strategy at least to, uh, uh, to open actually uh, the community uh, to some extent. Uh, we've seen that actually in China uh, uh, if we really have uh, no infection or very low rate of infection uh, actually having a relatively normal life actually can be possible uh, but really to scale this up uh, um, this reopening uh, to normal, scale this up to, to globally, uh, we really need to have uh, a vaccine or actually have uh, all, the, all the diseases actually under control. But people are tired. Right. I guess you can understand that. You're, besides your hat of being a scientist, you're also one of us. Right. So this fatigue phenomenon mm -hmm. will bring a lot of supporters to the other camp. Uh, I have certainly uh, seen uh, such fatigue uh, uh, in, the, in the society. Uh, I think uh, uh, what we can do, certainly uh, we continue uh, to focus our efforts uh, on antiviral or on vaccine uh, development, uh, but also what we can do is really to uh, work with uh, media and, and also uh, different uh, government bodies uh, to better communicate uh, uh, the situation uh, to the public. Um, I, I think uh, uh, having such actually uh, uh, open, uh, candid uh, uh, communication actually uh, is, uh, is even more important uh, uh, in the near future. You're watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. Coming up on our program, nearly half a year of coronavirus pandemic brought big changes to our lives. How did artists in the pursuit of their craft get used to this new normal? And what inspiration can we have from art these days? My visit to Beijing's Art Zone and chat with some of the artists. I'm um, very associated with this group of artists in the early 2000, 2010s called Post. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Worldwide, the countless exhibitions and art shows have been canceled or postponed due to COVID-19. But now that the threat of a pandemic has become a reality for people from all corners of the world, and who knows for how long. So how can creators of works of art, the artists, help in the global response? What inspirations can we get from them as the coronavirus forces us to endure an unprecedented time of social distancing. How do artists and audiences cope with the new normal? Bearing all these questions in mind, I paid a visit to 798 Art Zone in Beijing and talked to artists and curators there. We are all in this unprecedented experience of a global pandemic. While we are trying to struggle with the uncertainties of daily life, we also try to come to terms with what the new normal means for all of us, today and possibly forever. That's why we come to art, for rescue, for guidance, and hopefully even some joy. Right here in downtown Beijing, an art exhibition, Meditations in Emergency. Hopefully, there will be some answers inside. All these artworks were created before the big pandemic, but they managed to speak to us in a different way now, thanks to the exhibit curators who presented them in a new light. While doing the rounds, Vivek Tinari, the director of the UCCA Center for Contemporary Art, gave me his take on why these works are up for another closer look. Now this artist, Oliver Larrick, based in Berlin, um, very associated with this group of artists in the early 2000s, 2010s called post-internet. So they were the, really the first artists to start thinking about you know, how much of our lives we live online and uh, what that does to our minds. Um, but here he's, he's creating all these connections, visual connections between different forms, um, morphing, right? Things turn into one another. And what you really have is, uh, I think what's interesting to note is 
you go from human to kind of non-human figures. So people aren't the, the protagonist necessarily, you know, turn into a dog or a horse, and back into a person, and on and on. Because really, this, this whole section of the show, these artists in this part, it's the middle, kind of pivotal section, are all, in one way or another, exploring the relationship between human and animal. Yes. And actually, we are just part of the world, the, the animal world, in a way. Of course. And this is one of the, again, like lessons of the pandemic, right? I mean, regardless of what you think about its origins, we know that this virus is found not only in humans, but in other strains of animals as well, right? So it's, um, I think we definitely have been forced to reconsider our, our place in this ecological system. And yeah. For artists like these, we also see them and their works in ordinary days, but now it's a very different layer of what they're trying to say. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, this, is a, this piece is a great example of that, right? It was made a, long before the, the pandemic, but, but yeah, if suddenly we reconsider this context and these relationships, and it just takes on a whole new meaning. Exactly. I know you have a lot of other works to show me around. Sure, let's yeah. keep going. Okay, okay great. Good. Zhang Pei Li, you know, is one of the real heroes of the Chinese avant-garde. Sure. We call him the father of video art. You know, he was the first person to make that kind of work back in the 80s already. Um, but this is a much more recent project, still before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, last year, he started going to um, Carrara, you know, mm -hmm. the quarry in, in, in Italy, where Michelangelo and all the great sculptors of the Renaissance got their marble. Mm -hmm. um, but actually what he did is he, he took a CT scan of his whole body and then using 3D printing created molds based on this and then, and then basically so sculpted. these are all this, these 3D? are his bones. Oh, wow. Yeah, basically, or like life-size images or replicas of, of his own bones. If you put it together, you'd have a whole skeleton. Of Zhang Peili. Of Zhang Peili. <laughs> More about him than you ever want to know. Yeah. But, um, no, I think, I, I love this piece because, you know, while death and mortality are such common topics in, in art, you know, going back through the ages. Right. Um, but for him to encounter this so directly, I think during this pandemic, you know, all of us thought at one point or another about our own mortality. And these are the interesting. Yeah, so, 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 you know, here you have the bones and then there you have these uh, solids. They represent the, the, the same weight as the amount in his body of uh, fat, okay. of, of blood, and of water. So, they're, you know, these materials, crystal versus marble, different weights and densities, so you need a bigger size. but. He's, you know, it's, very, it's a very precise exhibition. He's trying to um, represent himself mm. in, a, in an honest and systematic and scientific kind of way. Philip showed me around and introduced me to Zhang Hui, an artist who has a unique eye for people in uniforms. Now his old works about nurses are shown in a different light. That's fascinating, not only to the audience, but even the artist himself. Some special environments, like hospitals, airports, these places have professional characteristics, not an ordinary environment. I think it can be analyzed and researched as a subject using the method of drawing. So I created this work. I saw it was painted in 2018. This time, we see the efforts that a lot of medical workers have done in this epidemic. Do viewers have more empathy? Because a lot of media are reporting the dedication and sacrifice of medical workers, many people find these works resonating with them emotionally. At this special time, this exhibition uses such a presentation to consolidate the multidimensional and multi angle thinking from several artists to reflect on the current special situation. I think it's particularly good. This kind of empathy makes people feel they are indistinguishable from each other when they come here, and the part between the wall of the museum and the outside world is eliminated, making it a huge museum. As an artist, do you think there is a great relationship with the pandemic, your life, your work? Many things I thought it was an analytical reality before, but now it seems that the reality is a personal assumption and a little illusory. This epidemic has brought me back. It turns out that reality still has so many dimensions and so many things that are usually shielded, 
This outbreak suddenly makes things more real. After experiencing the epidemic, my thinking is more real than before. I will slow down myself and chew on every piece of my work. I will study every piece of work again and again. I don't want to be rushed or reject experience. I want to be as comprehensive as possible. Philip, good to see you. Great to be back. Meditations in an emergency. Frank O'Hara, wow. Yeah, um, I mean, so obviously a great American poet of the mid-century. Um, he only lived to be 40 years old. And actually, during his lifetime, he was more famous as an art curator than as a poet. He was a curator at, at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art. And, you know, his poetry is so beautiful, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but he, he uses ordinary language. So it's almost like pop art, you know, but in, in, in poetry, in literary form. Um, uh, some of his poems, there's one, there's one called Having a Coke with You. Um, but, but, of course, Meditations in an Emergency is the name of a poem, but also of uh, a collection of poems that he published in, 19, in the 1960s. Why is that phrase so much what you wanted for this exhibition? <laughs> Nothing's canceled, but everything's postponed, right? Obviously, it's not a time to make a show with a, with a big budget, with a big team coming from abroad. So we had to suddenly think of a new exhibition to, oh, to reopen with. And you know, what else is on everyone's mind right now but the situation? I mean, it would have felt wrong to do anything else, anything else a, a so-called normal show in these very abnormal times. So. What was really great about it was it gave the team a chance to really use their, their minds and their eyes and their sort of curatorial muscles. So I, I basically put them in a room and said, you guys have one week, you know, let's come up with a proposal. It gave us a bit of advice. I'll take credit for the title, uh, nothing else. Uh, the, the selection of the artists, um, the presentation, the design, it was really all done by us. Uh, the six-person curatorial team, very outstanding young Chinese curators, but so many other people uh, from the communications to the design to the production that get involved. And it was really a chance for us, you know, this, there's this Frank O'Hara quote about in times of crisis, you must decide again and again uh, who you love, right? And not just who you love, but kind of what you love and who you are. And, you know, it really makes you confront these big questions. And many of their works actually is pre-2020 January. Almost all of them. Almost all of them. And yet they have very new significance now. Absolutely. Did you open the new eyes to things that you have not noticed before as much as you did now? It's not, a, it's not like you're choosing the winner of a prize. No. It's, you're thinking more just how can I put things together in a way that's interesting, that will make them appear in a new light, and that will bring out their connections uh, to this present moment. Because, of course, with such little time, no one's making a new piece of art, in very few cases. I mean, one or two pieces are brand new. The rest are existing. Even um, the paintings of Zhang Hui, you know, of these two nurses wearing masks, actually it's the same nurse, and of, of this nurse with her mask, it's actually from 2018. But, you know, put in this time where we're all wearing masks all the time, it takes on this new significance. And I think that's, that's the thing about important art, is that it can mean something different at different times. Its relevancy is always there. Absolutely. But it takes eyes to discover those relevancies. And it also takes echoes, you know, among the curators and artists at a different time in order to find those relevancies. And of course, yeah, and it's a conversation. And we're always, you know, maybe we would approach an artist and say, we're very interested in this piece that you made. And they would say, well, actually, OK, I see what you're trying to do here. Because we had a document just kind of explaining our concept and they say, actually, this piece, I think, makes more sense. And we would say, aha, uh -huh, you're, you're right. Which one did you, did you discover during the process? <laughs> so there's a wonderful young, um, uh, he's originally Lebanese, I believe he's based in the UK now, called Lawrence Abu Hamdan. Um, and he made this beautiful video where he's talking about walls. And we, we were thinking of him in all kinds of different contexts. He was one of the winners of the Turner Prize this, this year. It was a very important prize given by uh, the Tate in, in London. And, you know, at this time when, you know, our, our American president has spent four years trying to build a wall, um, and when kind of borders are suddenly more important than they were before, 
this, this meditation of his about what is a wall kind of started to seem quite important for this show. This is really what I want to ask you about the so-called new normal. We all have to deal with it. We all have to form it in a way. What is the new normal that you can describe verbally to us as a curator, as an art institution director? You know, I mean, I've been very lucky. I've, I've worked almost my whole career in China. I'm American, as you can tell or as you know. Um, and it's been amazing to watch the, the art scene develop here and to watch it become so international. Even in this moment of different kinds of tension, I think it can show what's possible. Um, and it can allow us, allow our viewers and our, our different stakeholders um, it c can be a way of reminding ourselves that there, there are these possibilities for a different kind of understanding. This piece of Amiko Lee, um, and it's actually really this very serious meditation about um, his time in a hospital. He had a skin problem, and so he was studying in, in the U.S., and he spent all kinds of time in and out of the hospital. Uh, he made this environment. We'll go look at it. I mean, I'll show you, but it, you look around, and... Um, what it's become known for online are, you know, there's these kind of very fun red arches and this blue carpet, the colors are dramatic, and there are these elements from like Chinese traditional medicine, uh, you know, mannequins scattered around. But then you look on the, on the walls and it's this kind of photographic essay about his illness and recovery and all these different questions that that raised. And that's one of the sections of the show is really talking about, you know, how the pandemic kind of brought us all into closer relationship to our own mortality. And our own body. Our own body, yeah. Our own life, in a way. Indeed. The other thing is how people are wondering, we are learning, listening, feeling, touching, smelling, all these senses. How are our senses are opened up as a result of a totally new normal these days? I guess in the art world, it could be also a reflection of that. I think... Um we just become so much more attuned to our immediate environment. You know, and that, that's the first section of the exhibition. It's called this, The Fragile Everyday. And the inspiration for that was really this idea that we were all going through at one point where you know, people stayed at home for one month, two months. In the case of half people year. in Wuhan, almost half a year, right? And, and never leaving. And so suddenly, on the one hand, you know, what you thought of as the everyday routine before completely upset and uh, re rearranged. And on the other hand, you have this like just incredibly deep relationship to to your surroundings, the people around you, uh, and the th even the objects and the spaces that that are around you. Um, and that's a, that's a very artistic process. You think about artists like Bruce Nauman, was an important American artist from the 60s, who made these videos where he would just walk around his studio, kind of in a circle, again and again. Or I think about the uh, Taiwanese-born. American artist Xie uh, Ching, Te Ching Xie, who you know in the 80s in New York was making these pieces. Like he made one piece where he lived for one whole year in a cage, yes. or where he punched a time card every hour for a whole year. So I think these kinds of um, there's a whole series of works related. Series, yeah, to not in this show, but I mean, yeah. you know, artists have been guides for us um, to be with themselves, to be with themselves, and to think about kind of you know putting themselves in kind of very extreme circumstances and situations. That's always been something that you know, modern and contemporary artists have done. Are the artists, or is the art world the fortune teller or the historian? Wow. In other words, do they know more than we do before it happens, or do they only, in conclusion, trying to draw us to something? I, think it, I honestly, this is going to sound like it's such an easy answer, but it's really both. Because I think artists, you know, their job is to see things, and that's what they do all day. And so it's kind of natural that they can sometimes do that before the rest of us. Um, so many times you see uh, ideas that kind of come to the fore in, in artistic production and that later kind of make their way into the broader society. I mean, think about like uh, American artist Adrian Piper, who did a lot of really cutting edge work about identity and race um, and stereotyping and these things, you know, in the 80s. I was already talking about these issues. You look at the work now and it, f it feels like it was made yesterday, you know, in the context of all the recent um, yeah. events in the U.S., yeah. At the same time, you know, why is it, if we just, one thing I did during this period was kind of rewrote our, uh, our values, like of, of our team and of our institution. 
And the very last, you know, sort of item, I mean, I ask myself, you know, why, you know, I, I, I could have been a journalist or done all these other things too, right? Um, but for me, art is so convincing because I think when we're all gone, a few hundred thousand years from now, you know, it's, and we look back at previous civilizations and what's really left to us, you know, of course, um, some artifacts and, and, and things, but it's really the art, right? It's really the way that we are able to understand the people who came before us. So, yeah, working with artists is such a great way to stay in touch with, you know, really what it is that makes us all human. Phil, thank you so much for hosting us. Great to be here together. Thank you. As they say, art is the reflection, but also could be the solution when we don't have the answers. That's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insights into your search engine. Check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. I'm Tian Wei on behalf of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. And have a great weekend.